morning. Good, I wasn't expecting a response, it's excellent. Congratulations for being here. It's, it's so awesome to see so many people in this room and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come here to hear from some amazing speakers. I'm really looking forward to talking to you all today how we can imagine a better world. Hands up, who's heard of the Movember Foundation? Excellent. Who's participated in Movember? Excellent. Great to see a few Mo Bros and Mo Sisters in the room. <laughs> Excellent. How far have you travelled to be here today? Hands up if you've spent more than 50 miles to get here. Excellent. More than 2,000 miles? Has anybody spent more than 8,142 miles to get here? <laughs> One in the audience? Just in case you're wondering, that's the distance from Australia, Melbourne, Australia, down under, all the way here to Seattle. And I know that that's going to be worth every single mile travelled to be here to talk with you today. Did you know that men's health is in a state of crisis? Men live, on average, six years less than women. Do you know why? There's no genetic reason for this. It's because men leave it too late. I can hear all the women in the audience saying, I go to the doctor, I get checked up when something isn't right. And for all the men in the room, you need to get up. When something isn't right, go and see a doctor. We know this is a great way to have a positive impact on your life. At the Movember Foundation, we focus on three main men's diseases. Prostate cancer. Three million men in this country today are living with prostate cancer. And one in nine will deal with a prostate cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. Testicular cancer. You may have heard of this be described as a young man's disease. And the great news is, over 95% of men diagnosed will survive. When you think about that, that's still one in 20 brothers, fathers, sons, partners, uncles who won't make it. And we want to do something about that. And finally, mental health and suicide prevention. One man every minute globally dies by suicide. By the time we finish talking today, over 45 men will have taken their own lives. I'm sure you're not happy about that, and neither are we. We've got some really big goals that we hope will make a really positive impact in this space. Firstly, we aim to halve the number of men who are dying by prostate cancer and testicular cancer. Second of all, we want to halve the number of men who are suffering serious psychological and physical side effects of the cancer treatment. And finally, we want to quarter the number of men who are dying dying by suicide. These are big goals, and we know we can't do them by ourselves. The Movember Foundation imagines a better world. We know that we need to bring the best and brightest minds together to tackle these problems. We put a lot of effort into building networks of people and bringing them together and collaborating around these men's health issues. We also know that we have to continually invest in research and evaluating that research to make sure it's having the impact. We also know that we have to talk to men in their language, to get the cut through, to communicate with men. For all the men in the audience, we run a global campaign 
called Check Your Nuts. <laughs> How's that for direct? <laughs> Overall, Movember has funded over 1,200 men's health programs. We're now in the process of scaling those programs to reach the lives of millions of men. I'm here today to talk to you about how we're using technology and innovation to have a positive impact on the world, to change the face of men's health. Have you ever wondered how a men's health charity might start? I bet you didn't think two guys in a pub having a quiet beer one Saturday afternoon is how it all started. That's exactly where the Movember Foundation was born. Two mates, Luke and Trav, were sitting down, having a few quiet beers, talking about fashion. Bell-bottom trousers, double denim, parachute pants. I'm sure a few of you may have been guilty of such fashion faux pas in the past. I know I certainly owned some parachute pants in the 90s, so hands up for being guilty. As the night wore on, they started to talk about the moustache. The moustache had been the mainstay of male fashion in the 70s and 80s. It had all but disappeared in the 90s. You know when you're out with a few mates and you have a light bulb moment? You think, yeah, we're going to do something. That's exactly what the guys did. They decided to bring the moustache back. By the end of the night, they had 30 mates roped in to grow in a moustache. That was the first Movember campaign. Do you know how much money they raised that year? The princely sum of zero dollars. <laughs> However, they realised something much more powerful. They had friends, family, even complete strangers coming up to them, asking about, what's that moustache? What's that thing on your upper lip? It was creating conversations. They realised something much more powerful. Do you know what they did? The next year, they got a few more guys together to grow more moustaches. They raised $54,000 that year. And they decided to donate it to the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. That was the largest single donation the foundation had ever received. From two guys in a pub, We've grown to over six million people who have participated in our annual fundraising campaign. We're now in the top 45 NGOs globally and consistently raise over $100 million a year. So from two guys in a pub to six million people, it's been a hair-raising journey. <laughs> I've always worked in technology. It's all I've ever done. My first job was as a content manager. I used to get a piece of paper back in the day from the marketing director with lines, move this, change that, make that bigger, make that smaller. That was my job. I'd design and write content. I moved into programming, then into project management, then into program management, delivery leadership. I've helped some of the largest organisations in the world, such as GE, roll out agile transformations. Although I'd never thought about working in men's health. The thought had never crossed my mind. Imagine a lovely sunny day like today. I was on my lunch break. I was out for a bit of fresh air. Walking down the road and my phone rings. It was someone I knew who kept on trying to offer me a job. And you know that really awkward moment where it's getting built beyond, uh, beyond politeness and I, I wasn't sure if I should pick up. OK, I thought about it. G'day. Hey, Byron, how would you feel about being the next CTO of Movember? OK, sounds pretty good. Great. I want you to go down to the Bridge Hotel, look out for the guy with the moustache. That's Adam. He's the CEO. Go and have a chat. Rocked up. Had a really great, great conversation with Adam. I was really motivated around the work they were doing and was super pumped. Adam asked me to go into the office the next day to talk to the, the broader team. Met with HR, had lunch with the leadership team. I thought I was an absolute shoo-in. I heard nothing. 
for three weeks. I finally get this frantic phone call. Byron, 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 Byron. It was the HR director. We've been calling you and emailing you, nothing. We've heard nothing. Uh, I haven't heard anything. Like, I haven't received any emails. Oh, oh, the email address is wrong. Oh, the phone number's wrong. Anyway, would you like to come work for us? Uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. That was the point I thought to myself, these guys really need to help with their technology. <laughs> Innovation isn't always about amazing ideas with technology. Often, it's about deeply immersing yourself into a problem space, looking beyond what's immediately in front of you, digging deeper to look for new ways to create amazing outcomes. It's an environment where not one person owns what's in or out of scope. There's a collective group of people who are able to contribute to build great outcomes. It's a vision to change what exists today. And for us, innovation is about building a better world, a better world for the men that we serve. I'm really excited today to be here to talk to you around how we're going about this. For us, innovation is three things. It's the problem and opportunity. Understanding what problems are you trying to solve. Deeply immersing yourself to understand that in a really detailed way. It's about community. Talking to your community. Understanding who they are. Delving in to looking at the problems that they're experiencing. And finally, it's culture. Creating the right culture within your organisation to create that environment that allows innovation to prosper and grow. We're going to talk about all three of these today, and I'm hoping you can come away with some really practical tips that you can take back to your organisations. The problem. Have you ever been in a situation where you've received a brief from the business? You've been working really hard to design an amazing solution. You and your team have built it, you've tested it, you've deployed it, and you've got it out to market. You've done a great job, it's been really successful. How do you know the business has actually solved the right problem? You don't. There is an absolute risk that what you have built, while you've done it in a really amazing way and you've delivered some great outcomes, you haven't actually solved the problem that your community was experiencing. I'd like to propose an alternative. Understanding the problem space. Deeply immersing yourself to look at all of those nuances, the experiences people are having. I love this quote. I want you to fall in love with the problem and not the solution. What does that mean? It means bringing the community into those conversations, understanding what experiences are having before you consider technology, before you consider what you're going to do about it. Fall in love with the problem and not the solution. We were undertaking a piece of work in testicular cancer research. We had a research advisory committee that had told us the problem with testicular cancer is when a man is diagnosed. He walks out of the GP's office, he doesn't know to turn left or turn right. That was the problem we were given. It was really clear and really well defined. Have you ever been in that situation where somebody has asked you to take that piece of technology over there and make it work over there? Does that resonate with people? Does it ever work? No. That was exactly the situation we faced. We had a piece of work, a piece of technology, a system we'd been working on in prostate cancer. 
it had delivered some really great outcomes. And we were asked to take that piece of technology and make it work for men with testicular cancer. It felt really awkward. It didn't feel like the right solution. And I remember the time I was sitting with the Director of Testicular Cancer Research, one of my delivery leads, and we were looking at this and thinking, how do we go about solving this? We've got a piece of technology, we've got a problem, they're fundamentally different. We had to take an alternative approach. I'm going to play a video right now, it's going to talk you through what we did. sitting at home on the couch recovering. Sitting on the couch at home recovering. They didn't know what was going to happen. There was a high sense of anxiety and there was a really, really large void of information. They didn't know what to do. So you know what we did about it? We created a resource, a digital resource, that allowed men to connect with other men who had been through similar journeys. We produced high quality content. It was produced by experts in the field, yet it still had the connection to a man. Men could understand that. We filled this void with information and the ability for men to understand what was next. What was the next stage? What was gonna to happen to them? What's the worst case? What's the best case? We absolutely filled this void with amazing content. I'm going to share some feedback with you right now. This is Ben. Ben's a MoBro. He's a MoBember ambassador. He's also a two times testicular cancer survivor. This is really impactful feedback. And for us, it makes us feel really proud that we've delivered amazing technology solutions by understanding the problem which have actually made a difference to men. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce some polling. So if you can pull out your devices, your phones, go to pollev.com slash mopoll. Now you should see this poll. Have you ever spent more time on the problem than the solution? I'd like to get a sense of the audience. Great, 100%, okay. Excellent. That's really encouraging. It's really encouraging to see a large number of you are doing this already. Really spending that time to understand how much goes in to producing an amazing solution. To give you a little context, we spent three months on that activity of understanding the problem. Three months. It only took four weeks to actually deliver the solution. 
So again, really understanding that problem for us paid a lot of dividends. And it's really clear that a lot of you in the audience are doing the same thing. And congratulations for that. Every organisation, regardless of what you do, is surrounded. You're surrounded by your community. They are the why. They are the why you exist. They are giving you your sense of purpose. As humans, and particularly those that work in technology, we are really good at making assumptions. You know, we sit in a boardroom, we write down assumptions on a wall. I've probably written thousands of assumptions over the course of my career. And every single time we do that, we create a little bit of bias in our minds. And over time, those assumptions start to crystallise. We get to a point where we actually are making decisions on the behalf of our community. There's a really big opportunity for everyone here to challenge yourself, to go to your community, to crush those assumptions. Are they true? Have we just made these things up? It's so important to have somebody from your community in the room when you're working through these problems. The insights that one or two people can give you are incredibly impactful. And for those of you who are not doing this, I absolutely encourage it. And again, for those of you who are talking to your community on a regular basis, it's really important. For us, our community are our Mobros and Mo Sisters, and of course, the men that we serve. Some time ago, we were going through the process of redeveloping our fundraising app. So this was an app that our fundraisers, our Mobros and Mo Sisters were using during the course of our fundraising campaign. We thought it'd be worth asking the community for their feedback. So I had one of my designers come up to me and say, hey Byron, we want to run a poll. Great, it's a survey, let's get some feedback. We put it out there. We were hoping for maybe 500 responses. After a day or two, I asked the team, how's it going? Yeah, we've got 500. Wow, that's fantastic. That's a huge, huge amount of feedback. The team wanted to let it run for another day or two. I checked in again. 2,000 responses. 2,000 people had bothered to feed in feedback into our process. They wanted to let it run for another day or so. By the time we, we shut it down, we had 20,000 people had bothered to give us feedback. That was a huge amount of feedback we had from our community. We now had the task of trying to dissect that and understand what it absolutely meant, which was no small feat. We got a really good sense of the problems people were facing, how they were using the app, what they couldn't do, what they wanted to do. The results were amazing. That year, our fundraising app was featured as the app of the day in the Apple's I Apple iTunes store, which for us was an amazing achievement, and I don't believe that would have been possible without the feedback we got from our community. 20,000 responses is huge. You don't need that much data. The power of one, the insight from one person, can be just as powerful. We were running a hackathon a few years ago. Everyone's run hackathons before? Yep. Hackathons are great. They allow your teams to think outside the box, think of new and innovative ways, try new things. The focus of our hackathon was on mental health. We called it hacking mental health. We were in a big warehouse, not dissimilar to this space in Melbourne. There was probably 100 or so people around. I looked in the corner and I saw somebody who just didn't seem like they fit in. He didn't have a laptop. You can imagine everyone else was there hacking away. We were trying to connect men with chatbots and all these different things to get men to talk. This one guy didn't have a, didn't have a laptop. He didn't even have a notepad. He just didn't look like he fit in. So I called over the coordinator of the event and I said, who's that guy? You know what he said? He's a plumber. 
A, a plumber? Yeah, he's a plumber. He'd finished work that Saturday morning. He was sitting on his couch. He was a Mobro. He saw a tweet from Movember saying that we were running a hackathon. He had no idea what a hackathon was. No idea at all. He decided to get off his couch and come down and participate. He had a real connection to our cause. He had some lived experience in mental health. So he was absolutely the perfect candidate to participate in this event. He had some of the most unique perspectives of anyone who was involved. He was able to bring ideas to the table that nobody else had. It was such an amazing experience to see him involved. And the result, his team won. And I'm absolutely sure that it was a direct result of having his feedback. So I talked to you about the example of 20,000 people responding to a survey. That's a huge amount. I don't want you to underestimate the power of one voice. One person can give you insights you hadn't possibly thought of previously. And I encourage you all, regardless of the size of your community, regardless of what you do, to bring the power of that one voice into the conversations you're having. Talk to your community about crushing the bias that you have. Challenge yourself to go about looking at your assumptions. Challenge those assumptions. Are they real? Are they false? All of these are really important questions. Imagine the impact you can have on your organisation if you're able to achieve some of that confirmation. Are you solving the right problems? Are you looking in the wrong spots? It's such an important element and asset that you have as, a, as an organisation. Let's ask the audience some more questions. So back to that same website before. How often do you talk to your community? Great. There's a lot of you who are really doing this. And I really applaud the effort. I'm sure you're gathering really insightful inputs from this group. There's a few of you in the room who do this on occasion. And if you can do it more often, I absolutely encourage that. And for those of you in the room who are not quite sure who your community are, I really encourage you to think about them. Understand who they might be and try. It doesn't have to be thousands of people. You can talk to one person in your community and get a deeper understanding of what they're experiencing. Get a deeper sense of the problems that they have. This can help guide you understanding the problems that they have and how you can solve them. That's a really great result and I really congratulate all of those in the audience for doing this today. Many organisations spend a lot of time telling their people to innovate. We see a need to create a culture that breeds innovation from within. And for us, culture is our innovation influencer. Creating the right culture to breed innovation is no small task. It can be very daunting. And I can hear you in the audience asking, well, what does the right culture look like? It may differ between organisation to organisation, even between team to team. However, there are some important characteristics that a really strong, innovative culture will have. Empowering your teams to be inquisitive. Giving your teams licence to solve problems without asking for permission. Making sure they feel the confidence that they can go out there, proactively look for problems, and then solve those problems. 
without having to ask people for permission. It's really important to be able to provide an environment that is free of fear of failure or consequence. Celebrating failure is an incredibly important activity. Something, oops, something we do on a regular basis. Making sure that you are understanding what hasn't worked and talking about that. And finally, creating an environment with either psychological or technical safety nets. Allow your teams to fail because they know the safety net exists. They know that if they break something, you have your bat their back. They have full confidence in understanding that it's okay to try and fail. They may be technical environments that you have, allowing your teams to go out there, spin up new ideas, and just spend time trying this out. The best way I can highlight how we've gone about creating a culture for innovation is by talking through one of our biggest failings. My team had spent a lot of time building an integration between our website and Salesforce. We wanted to use this as a way to deliver real-time data to our, our fundraising teams. The team had worked really hard on building an amazing solution. We'd tested it, we'd done all the things that you usually do. And above all, the team were really confident this was gonna make a difference for our fundraising teams. For a little bit of context, the biggest month of the calendar year for November is November. That is when we raise all the money. It is the money month. The team that built this solution are responsible for building and supporting a fundraising platform that delivers 99% of our revenue. So you can imagine the environment we were in. Incredibly high stakes. So we started off. The campaign started. The money started rolling in. And you know, sometimes you're just thinking to yourself, maybe this isn't going to be as great as we thought. As the money started coming in, the wheels started to get a little shaky. That year, we raised over $100 million. We realized that for every donation we received, there was 55 API calls back and forth to Salesforce. Now, I'm not going to get too technical with you, but that's a lot. $100 million of donations. So what happened? Any guesses? <laughs> it blew up. The whole thing like completely imploded. Luckily, all of our donations and payments were kind of over there, completely separate, so we were still making money. That was the main thing. But the solution the team had built crashed and burned. Imagine how they felt. They'd spent months working on this solution. And it was an incredibly dark day. People were fearful of their jobs. They felt like they had let the business down. This was a really unique opportunity. An opportunity to take a situation that was quite bad. The team was still trying to like raise a sunken ship. And I said, stop. Don't keep doing that. You're not going to be able to achieve that. This is in a four-week window. I used the opportunity to refocus. Refocus the team on a positive solution. I had to give them confidence. No one here is going to lose their job. No one here will be reprimanded for this issue. That's not going to happen. That is not something we're going to do. By refocusing their efforts on understanding what happened, understanding this is during campaign, so the, the donations are still coming in. This was the most unique opportunity throughout the entire year to learn. So that's exactly what we did. We analysed, we understood, we looked at the problems. I asked the team at the end of the month, what do you know now that you didn't know three weeks ago? They said, oh, 
we know a hundred times more about the architecture. We know exactly what happened. We know all these things that we should have done. That was an amazing outcome to achieve. And that was really one of the first steps that we had to create an innovative culture. And fast forward about two months. The team said, Byron, we've got a presentation for you. And I said, great, I love presentations. This will be great. So get me in the room. And it wasn't before too long I realised what this was. It was a business case. They wanted to improve the problem that we'd experienced. They wanted to spend time fixing this, just to prove the idea, to prove a concept. I asked the question, why am I here? They said, you're the head of technology. You have to approve this. I said, why? Why do I need to approve this? They said, well, surely you, you know, there's money involved. How much money? Oh, about 500 bucks. <laughs> it was for AWS, so it was pretty good value for money. <laughs> I said, $500? You want me to approve $500? I said, yeah. Do you think that what that $500, do you think that will prove this is a problem and you'll be able to test a solution? They said, yes. I don't need to be involved, guys. I don't need to be here to approve that. You have my complete confidence. It was at that point I realised we still had some way to go with our culture. We still had some yards to go to make people feel confident. Confident that they could identify a problem and fix it. They didn't need to ask my permission. I actively say, don't ask, don't ask me for money. Show me the outcome. Show me the showcase. Give me an example of how you've done that. So fast forward two years. The team had proven the idea. It worked really well. We put a considerable amount of investment into that solution. Today, it is the single most strategic piece of data infrastructure in the entire organisation. It delivers real-time analytics to our teams. It helps our fundraising teams make decisions around who they fundraise with. It helps our programs team understand the investments they should be making. And I firmly believe that we would not be in the position we are in today without two people coming to me asking for permission to spend $500 because we've invested in that culture. Creating the environment where people are inquisitive, proactively seeking problems to solve. Creating the right culture will allow a mindset to form in your teams a mindset that will have them challenge the status quo, look for ways to improve, and always be thinking about new outcomes they can deliver, thinking about the problems that they can solve, understanding the needs the community has. It's been a long and arduous journey, but the impact has been quite fantastic. And I encourage all of you to think about ways that you can drive that culture within your organisations. I'd like to get another poll now. So back to the same website. How does your culture allow for risk taking? Do you celebrate risk? Is it something you're trying or something that, is it too much at stake? We've had to really focus on this. Risk failure doesn't come naturally. The appetite to celebrate failure is really difficult for people. We actually have an a, a award that I've introduced in the team called the Rusty Bolt. It's about talking about the things that you've stuffed up. We have a lot of people coming to our meetings talking about failure, sharing ideas, and there's a lot of cross-pollination that happens. So for those of you in the audience who are doing this, again, I really applaud your efforts. But there are quite a few of you who still have this as an opportunity. Think about one conversation you can have with one person about this. Just starting that conversation, making it okay. Making it okay to fail. Making it okay to have the conversation to learn. Before I talk to you about the two people that came to me asking for permission to spend $500, what would you do in that situation? If you have a team come to you saying, we want to make some investment. 
Will you ask them for a business case, outlining what they're spending, the benefits, the return on that investment, all of the usual process? Or will you ask them for a showcase? That's a challenge I want you to take back to your organisations. Business case or showcase? Today we've learnt about how the Mobama Foundation has grown from two guys in a pub to one of the world's largest men's health charities. And we've done that through some really serious investment in innovation. We've talked about innovation as being three things. Number one, understanding the opportunity and the problems you're trying to solve. Spending that time delving in to what your community is experiencing. Number two, we've talked about your community, understanding who they are. Imagine the power of bringing the community into the conversation, understanding their needs, validating the problems they're having. And finally, we talked about culture. How do you create a culture that allows innovation to prosper? Creating a culture that breeds innovation from within. For those of you in the audience who are brave and want to try new things. I have three challenges for you. I want you to try these when you get back to your desk on Monday morning. Number one, I want you to understand one problem. Whoops, one problem, that's right. One problem you're trying to solve. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. It can be a tiny little problem. Understand that one problem. Internally, externally, doesn't really matter. Number two, I want you to talk to two people in your community. I want you to talk to them about that problem. Is it real? What assumptions have you made? What bias do you have in your minds that you have to crush? Understanding their point of view will absolutely help you understand what the problem is. Again, I want you to fall in love with the problem and not the solution. It can be internal people to your organisation, it can be your external community, but spend that time understanding who they are and understanding the problems they're experiencing. And finally, I want you to encourage three people to start working on that problem. Don't start with the entire organisation. Start with three people in your teams. It doesn't have to be for six months. It can be for a couple of weeks. But get them to focus on that problem. Get them talking to your community and challenge them to create a better outcome than exists today. Again, looking at how you start to create that culture of innovation will have that amazing impact on your organisation. These are three challenges. Take them back, start to work on them as soon as you get back to your, your desk. I'm sure you're going to have a huge impact on your business as a result of these three changes. That's how Movember is going about creating a better world through innovation. That's how we imagine a better world. And that's how we are changing the face of men's health. Thank you, Byron. And thank you, Movember Foundation, for being here.